So the next problem we're going to talk about is retinopathy or prematurity, and it has to do with what happens with the preterm infant's eyes. It's related to gestational age and birth weight. It's rare in babies that are born um, birth weights greater than uh, 2,000 grams. But basically you're going to see, when basically what happens is, the baby, the preterm baby, when they're born, their eyes are not fully developed. The, the vessels in their eyes are not fully developed. And so the blood vessels stop growing at birth and they get a different type of vessel growth and the normal vessel growth ceases. That coupled with high concentration of oxygen damages the small capillaries in the eyes and they can develop a, a type of a blindness. <clears throat> a good example of this is Stevie Wonder. Um, when he was born, you know, they didn't know that high concentrations and high pressures of oxygen could cause damage to a preterm baby's eyes. Um, but babies that are on high concentration of O2 and high pressures of O2 and vent dependent, etc., have an increased risk for this developing. So they'll have what's con what is progressive uh, scar tissue and retinal detachment. And it's just ca it's caused by prematurity, the fragile retinal vessels, and the fluctuating oxygen administration that leads to rapid vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Um, and it, it it is problematic, and it's something that we try to prevent. The um, next high risk con uh, topic that I want to talk to you about is meconium aspiration syndrome. This is a uh, increased risk for babies who are post dates or babies who are stressed in utero and we talked about you know a baby who um you know when they experience fight or flight in utero the fight or flight response one of the things that happens is their sphincters relax and they release meconium and so if they are in meconium stained amniotic fluid they have a increased risk of developing this but what you'll see is a baby who um, aspirates meconium they may have meconium stained fluid in their um, in their mouth in their nose in their uh, lower respiratory tract such as their trachea and it can actually go into their lungs so in utero a sudden gasp of of taking um, amniotic fluid in surges through their mouth it, it makes its way into their mouth and into their lower to their lower uh, airway and it becomes a significant problem after delivery they've aspirated meconium into the tracheobronchial tree and it causes air to be trapped in their um, their airway when they start breathing and it causes over distension of the alveoli and the alveoli can actually rupture um, we do try to prevent meconium aspiration you may see um, a, a couple of approaches to this typically they try to really suction the baby out at delivery but some physicians may as soon as the baby's head is delivered um, they would suction the mouth and the throat this is really no longer supported by research because what was happening is they were taking too long to suction out uh, the baby uh, to get, deliver the baby um, but some doctors still do do some suctioning if they have thick meconium after birth they have to look as the baby crying or not crying if they're crying they're gonna suction their their oral they're gonna suction their mouth and you know out with a bulb syringe if they're not crying they may visual they may you know do some respiratory support they may um, stick in an ET tube to see if we have um, you know meconium below the vocal cords and suction um, it just really depends your nursing interventions are to maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation support regulate regulate the baby's temperature when try keep them warm you're gonna administer IV fluids accurately and um, carefully we're going to assess for hypoglycemia they may give the baby some antibiotics and watch their caloric intake however if the baby didn't continues to have respiratory issues in transition they may have to have other measures such as uh, they may have to be ventilated they may have to have nitric acid support or nitric acid therapy or ECMO therapy
So this is a baby who is obviously meconium stained being delivered and the doctor is just shucking the baby's mouth uh, before the rest of the baby is born. Um, but they can do other approaches as well and that they're intubating the baby and um, because this baby had transitional issues due to meconium aspiration syndrome. When you look at the pathology, meconium in the lower airway is it's almost like dumping chemical lye in the baby's lungs. It's not that it causes massive burning, but it causes a lot of inflammation and edema, and it causes the release of histamines. In addition, surfactant doesn't work well. Um, they have direct toxicity by meconium um, uh, particles. It causes pulmonary vasoconstriction, and it causes the alveoli, because surfactant doesn't work well, the alveoli become stiff. Um, and they have airway trapping, which you learned about in uh, 1601 when you talked about COPD, but they'll have airway obstruction. And what the baby can develop, kind of what you learned in uh, 1601, they can develop a barrel chest, which you see in this picture of this baby who has meconium aspiration uh, syndrome. So they may intubate the baby. Um, they may try nitric uh, acid therapy. Basically what nitric acid therapy does is it causes the, the, the alveoli and the blood vessels in the lungs that are not impacted by the meconium to dilate. So those vessel, those, uh, those um, alveoli and the blood vessels that are surrounding them can take in more oxygen. Um, so it's kind of like a, a, a brink bronchial dilator, if you will. It, it allows more oxygenation to occur and lessens the, the incidence of chronic lung disease. However, um, I, I, I think of it as a vasodilator, but sometimes that's enough for the baby and the baby can be fine. Some babies, even with nitric acid, they they don't show improvement. So what they may need to do is put the baby on ECMO. So what ECMO is, is kind of, it's basically a heart and lung machine. It's a bypass machine. The baby's lungs will heal given enough um, time, but you basically can't say to the baby's body, you know, take some time off, stop breathing, let the lungs heal, and then come back in a couple of days and, you know, be okay. You need lungs for a metabolic to support life. So um, putting the baby on an ECMO machine allows the blood to be diverted from the baby's body. The blood is oxygenated, it's warmed, and it's returned back to the baby's body, to the aorta, to allow a bypass of the lungs, to allow the baby's lungs uh, time to heal. It's very similar to a dialysis. They're going to have a major catheter placed, um, and it's going to, you know, the tube is going to enter down through the vena cava to the heart. Um, it crosses, it, it, it's going to be threaded to the heart, what I want to kind of say to you, to the right atrium. This is a very intimidating picture to parents and their kid who's receiving ECMO. The baby is very, very ill. And so you have to have very specialized, highly trained nurses um, in the NICU environment that are going to administer care for a baby receiving ECMO. And you can this can be scary for parents because they don't understand what's happening and um, what all of these different machines are doing. And it's even a little bit more scarier because they're told this baby is very sick and they have to be separated from the other babies in, in the uh, NICU environment. This is my nephew who had to have ECMO and I don't show this picture to you just to show you a picture of my neck of my nephew, but I wanted to show you a picture, a close up of the tube and I couldn't find pictures to support what I'm saying to you, but you have two tubes here that are, that run to, uh, to the baby and you can see the darker tube and the, the, they both contain blood. The one that um, is darker is taking the unoxygenated blood away from his body to the ECMO machine where it's going to be oxygenated and it's going to be warmed. And then this kind of lighter red tube is bringing the um, oxygenated blood back. But you will notice how edematous he is. And that's one of the problems with high risk babies is um, maintaining uh, fluid balance. They they can become hypovolemic and or hypo, um, new, um, they can become de dehydrated easily. It's a fine, kind of a fine a, a tightrope that you're walking. I My nephew is fine. <laughs> He's fine. He likes to show people the scar on his neck. He's good. <laughs> so, But 
that I show this because it was it's kind of scary for parents who don't understand what's going to happen and here I am an OB nurse who understands this and trying to help my sister and my brother-in-law understand something that's very technical and they're you know they're non-medical people they're my sister is a social worker this was a lot for them to take in the next high risk condition I want to talk to you about is NEC, which stands for necrotizing intercolitis. This is a disorder of inflammation and ischemia um, and necrosis of the intestinal walls. It's a, a problem that happens in preterm babies. Um, there's several theories that uh, involve looking at the perfusion of the baby's gut that can lead to the ischemia bacteria and necrosis but it's a progressive disorder and it has an increased mortality rate of 15 to 30 percent especially in your very early babies um, but basically what you have happen is when we talked about babies don't have them the proteins necessary for metabolism um, when they're born early and we can try to start to feed them but they develop intestinal ischemia massive inflammation and bacterial coloniz colonization of the intestines and areas become necrotic so um, when you look at this pathophysiology they have to look at the type of feeding the baby's getting the tonicity of the feeding is it hypertonic um, are we feeding them too much are there issues that are causing hypoxia and ischemia to blood flow to the mucosal lining of the intestines did mom recently abuse cocaine is she breastfeeding if she's breastfeeding um, are there issues such as immunoglobulin issue there's several issues that have to be assessed but basically um, we're going to try to prevent this and if they do we're going to try to um, do early intervention to pre prevent severity um, and obviously morbidity and mortality some of the symptoms that this is developing you can see abdominal distension feeding intolerance uh, the baby will have emesis um, with feedings or after feedings you can in some babies have uh, frank bleeding from the rectum and diarrhea when they do a KUB or, or look at radiographical studies of the baby they're going to see x-rays are going to show loops of bowel and um, this is a baby that has this and you can see the distension um, you the things that make you concerned is the dull dusky color distended abdomen this baby also had uh, symptoms of sepsis temperature instability poor perfusion large uh, uh, residual bloody stools um, hypoactive or absent bowel sounds and abdominal tenderness so this is what you see on x-ray you can see the loops of bowel that uh, are showing uh, this problem so they're going to do they're going to do a couple of approaches one they may try gastric de decompression I have the baby MPO allow the bowel chance to rest um, if this continues and that you know that the allowing the gut to rest does not help in this necrosis uh, continues they may have to resection part of the bowel um, but we're going to do a collaborative approach. They're going to stop the feedings. They're going to give the babies ana antibiotics. They're going to put an NG tube and give gastric decompression. Um, they'll do parental nutrition and, and make sure the baby stays hydrated. Um, I want to end with uh, gastroteresis. And this is where a baby is born with the intestines outside of the abdominal wall. This can happen to preterm babies or term babies. Um, and the problem is the intestines have direct exposure to the amniotic fluid. So the intestines become thickened as well as because the baby did not have the intestines in the abdominal cavity, um, the baby has to develop, they have to stretch the skin over time to lower the intestines back into the baby's body, allow some of the um, edema in the baby's intestines to heal or to decrease and then lower the baby's intestines back into the baby's body and that's what you're seeing here they keep the intestines in a sterile sac and they keep it with uh, moist gauze and over time they lower uh, the intestines into the baby's body um, and it, the baby's uh, um, abdominal cavity will accommodate the intestines over time it just takes time for this to occur and then when they get them lowered in over time they will eventually close up the abdominal of the abdominal wall so in looking at your high-risk newborn information this is kind of your um, some of your major interventions despite the different conditions we gonna that we talked about um, 
all the babies are going to look at uh, thermoregulation. You're going to look at fluid and, and food needs. You're going to look at uh, temperature regulation, respiratory, and uh, supporting um, their transition from intrauterine life to external uterine life. This concludes our lecture for the high-risk newborn.